January the 4th, 1981, Britain's biggest ever manhunt finally came to an end. A man has been arrested in connection with the Yorkshire Ripper murders. He's been named as Peter Sutcliffe and lorry driver from Bradford. The Yorkshire Ripper was portrayed to the public as a maniac who stalked the red light areas of northern England, murdering and mutilating prostitutes. But the real story has never been told. The impact of the Yorkshire Ripper was enormous. I've never known a time as a police officer or as a father or as a husband when society was so traumatized by one individual. When he was arrested, the relief was enormous. We are absolutely delighted with developments at this stage. Absolutely delighted. Can you, you, can you all smile? Really delighted. George is delighted as well. Yes. Absolutely delighted. Yes. Under pressure from the world's media, police brought Sutcliffe to trial in just three months. It was meant to pacify an angry public, but it left many mysteries unsolved. Tonight, 16 years after his arrest, Network First will reveal the untold story of the Yorkshire Ripper, how he's attacked many more women than he's admitted, and how the unknown victims are still waiting for the whole truth. I don't like being associated with the Ripper, because in the public eye, he only went for prostitutes. But there's a lot more to the Ripper than that. He went for anybody, any woman who was on her own. It wasn't just prostitutes. Peter William Sutcliffe, you are charged that on the 30th of October, 1975, you did murder Wilma McCann. At his trial, Sutcliffe admitted attacking 20 women between 1975 and 1980. You did murder Emily Jackson. He pleaded insanity claiming that God had ordered him to kill prostitutes. But the jury found him guilty of 13 murders and seven attempted murders. So Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, is a mass murderer. As each of the 13 women's names was read out, the answer was the same, guilty of murder on all charges. But the police were convinced Sutcliffe hadn't told them the full story and began to re-examine their files on unsolved attacks. The police had already made one startling discovery in a check of criminal records. In August 1969, Sutcliffe was with a friend in Bradford's red light area. As they were chatting, he saw a prostitute walk past. He followed her. Then he attacked her with two stones wrapped in a sock. The police questioned Sutcliffe about the attack, but when the victim dropped the charges, the incident was forgotten. Two weeks later, Sutcliffe was again arrested, armed with a hammer and knife. This time, police did charge him, but only with going equipped to steal. He was fined £25. Twelve years later, these two incidents confirmed police suspicions that Sutcliffe was responsible for many more attacks than he'd admitted. It meant he'd been attacking women not for five years, but for eleven. From that came a feeling that someone ought to look at the outstanding murders and attempted murders that we may feel or felt were attributable to Sutcliffe. Uh, I got the job, as simple as that. The chief constable of the day said, I want you to do the job. 
Hallowell began to compile a definitive list of all the unsolved crimes Sutcliffe might have committed. When we first pulled everything together, there were in the region of 60 murders and attempted murders that either we believed or other forces believed Sutcliffe may well have committed. The cases began in 1966 and stretched right through the 1970s. Many were long before the Ripper's first acknowledged attack in 1975. They weren't only prostitutes. The victims included nurses, students, and hitchhikers. And they weren't confined to Yorkshire, but were scattered the length and breadth of the country. All the information we had on those were catalogued, and we looked at the factors which would eliminate Sutcliffe from them. For example, we knew from his driver's logs where he was, and he was in a different part of the country to where the crime was committed. This left Hallowell with about 20 unsolved crimes, with the Ripper's hallmarks, which he began to reinvestigate. One of these was a vicious attack on student teacher Gloria Wood. She had recently separated from her husband and was starting a new life. That night, Gloria was on her way to her new council flat on a Bradford estate. Coming through the school grounds, this man approached me. He came up to me and said, Can I carry your bag, love? No, thanks. I haven't got far to go. He seemed a right big man, staring eyes, dark brown eyes. And uh, it was an olive skin coloured, not black, not white, Mediterranean looking. Greek or Italian. He had a beard, black beard, black hair. When he lived down there, he's got a flat man who just moved in. I didn't feel a hammer blow. I didn't even feel it hit me. There was some youth at the end of the snicket. It must have interrupted him. Come on, Matthew, hurry up. I'm not going any faster. The little girl found me. She went into her mother and said there's a lady on the grass with red paint all over her. And that must have saved my life, really. Gloria was given life-saving surgery at this now derelict Leeds hospital. I remember waking up at the hospital with my mother and my father near the bed. I wondered why the police were there. It just didn't register on me that I'd been attacked. They said the cause of the injuries was a hammer blow. They had to cut a hole in my skull to get at the splints of bone that had gone into my brain. The police thought I knew who'd attack me, and I couldn't tell them because I didn't know. I couldn't think of anyone who'd want to attack me. I told them my attacker was a man with olive skin, quite tall, a beard, black hair, and they wrote it all down went away. Didn't hear from them for ages after that. Like many acknowledged Ripper attacks, it took place close to the A650 running through Bradford. 
It's just 15 minutes drive to the engineering plant where Sutcliffe clocked on for a night shift an hour later. It was the first of many ripper links Hellowell discovered. In many of the instances, the victims were followed and then approached by the offender. And in the cases that uh, P.C. Williams has agreed, um, he recognises that, that he did approach and he did speak to them. Can carry your bags, Lord? And have this calming effect on people. One uh, very strong point was the type of injuries and the weapon used. <laughs> A weapon used by Peter William Sutcliffe was a ball pain hammer. This actually leaves an indentation which looks like a crescent. In this case, there were four of those indentations on her skull. And there was a very good description given, which was very, very similar to Sutcliffe. Shortly before the attack, Gloria had temporarily put her children into care while she prepared a new home. The worst thing for me was... I've been on the verge of getting my children home. It was all arranged, they were coming home. But in the event, the children were sent to their father. Because I was in no condition to look after them, I couldn't even look after myself. Soon afterwards, Gloria had a nervous breakdown and is still receiving psychiatric help 22 years later. Nobody knows what that man put me through. He robbed me. With my family. There's dozens of women is attacked. They're wondering. And the families have got scars that will be with them for life. It's not just me. Within months, Hellowell had completed his research into all the unsolved crimes. Now it was time to meet Sutcliffe. My first meeting was, was at Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight, and it's a bleak place at the, re at the best of times, and it was a cold, grey day. You're in this very forbidding atmosphere, going through gates clonking and clinking and keys. And, of course, Sutcliffe didn't want to see me. He mistrusted the police because he felt that he'd been portrayed as a monster, which, of course, society believed that he is. So my first meeting was very brief. We had this conversation, I remember it was in the Padre's room at Parkhurst, and he left. Seven months after Gloria Wood was left for dead, Sutcliffe carried out his first acknowledged attacks. As with Gloria Wood, they were followed by a man who made small talk, then knocked them unconscious with a hammer. He was preparing to kill when he was disturbed. But because they weren't prostitutes, they weren't linked to the Ripper for many years. Two weeks later, a 14-year-old schoolgirl became the victim of another brutal and motiveless attack. Tracy Brown was walking home after spending the evening with friends in the quiet village of Silsden on the edge of the Yorkshire Moors. As I was walking up, my feet were hurting. It's one of those platform shoes are in fashion. So I decided to sit down on these bricks and take my shoes off. I just happened to look up and I was aware of this man walking towards me and he just stood there, looked at me for a couple of seconds and then started walking up the road. And I started walking up and he asked me my name and I told him. He said, there's nothing much doing in Sylvan, is there? I said, well, no, not really. Uh, and then he said, have you a boyfriend? He seemed a really charming, nice man. I had no reason to think that I was in a dangerous situation. He was very dark and he had these really mysterious dark eyes, his full black beard, and almost afro style hair. He'd lagged behind, and I just went 
to turn round to thank him for his company. I was shouting, please don't, please don't. And at the same time, I could hear his grunts with the, or the sheer impact of the blows of, oh, oh. And then the headlights of the car disturbed him. It picked me up and threw me over the fence to get him out of the way as quickly as possible. I remember scrambling around the fields and I remember feeling really weak, although I wasn't aware that I was nearly bleeding to death. from head to the waist in blood. They clean me up and they draw me back down to the farm. Tracy was rushed to hospital where only emergency surgery saved her life. Five vicious blows to the back of her head with a ball pain hammer had smashed her skull into fragments. The police asked me if I could do an identikit picture, which I did. To me, you couldn't have got a, a picture more perfect than that. It was pinned upon shop windows and shop doors for the few weeks after that. You know, if people recognise this man, please come forward. But no, a week, two weeks went by. No sign of any man being pulled in with afro hair, dark beard. The first thing in Tracy Brown's case was, of course, her description of the attacker and the photo fit. She also mentioned an accent, which was a very similar accent to uh, Peter William Sutcliffe's. Other circumstances, there was a car scene, close to the scene, at the, at the bottom of the hill, in fact, and that car was a similar car to one owned by Sutcliffe. There was the following and then the befriending, the injuries to the back of the head. And therefore, all of these features made it, uh, for me, clear that it was a serious contender for, for having been uh, committed by Peter William Sutcliffe. Though the attack on Tracy bore all the Ripper's hallmarks, it was never publicly linked to the man soon to become notorious as a prostitute killer. Despite Sutcliffe's initial refusal to talk to him, Hellowell persevered, and a bond of trust began to develop between the police chief and the Ripper. After the initial time with Sutcliffe, I think I got some measure of the man to understand him, to understand how he ticks, how he operates. And I knew that he had committed other crimes. And he knew that I knew. And I felt that one day, he would tell me. Chapeltown, the red light area in Leeds. It was here, in late 1975, that the Yorkshire Ripper legend was born. His first victims, the public was told, were prostitutes, Wilma McCann and Emily Jackson, murdered within a mile of the pubs and clubs where they touted for trade. Ever since Mrs. Jackson's body was discovered here, and ever since her killing was linked with that of Wilma McCann last October, the prostitutes of Leeds have walked in fear. Have you altered your opinion at all in this past week of the sort of man you're looking for? No, we're quite certain that this man hates prostitution. Late that night, the 
Over the next year, more and more women fell victim to the maniacal killer who seemed to be targeting prostitutes. Yet, despite the obvious similarities in the attacks, there was no mention of the earlier victims who were not prostitutes, including Gloria Wood and Tracy Brown. When I first put Tracy Brown to him, his first reaction was, no, I've done nothing else other than what I've told you. And therefore, any of the cases I put to him, he denied. I think as time went by, you gained some sort of respect. And he got to one stage where, where he said to me, you're right, it sounds as if I've done them. The description is, is of me. Uh, it's in the right time scale. The way that the person uh, killed or attempted to kill is the way that I operated. Uh, therefore, it must be me. Well, that is playing games. I was not happy with that. Critics believe all we're after is convictions. What we are after is the truth. In April 1977, 18-year-old Debbie Schlesinger was murdered in a quiet suburb of Leeds. She'd spent the evening with friends in a city centre pub before they all caught the bus home. We all walked home together, and going into her house first, and then my house was next, and Debbie had to walk round the block. As I got in, I was talking to my father, and I heard a scream, a really bad scream. And my, my dad opened the front door and said it sounded like Debbie. Within yards of her home, Debbie was stabbed. Then she was chased across the road by a man with dark hair and a beard. I came running over and found her slumped in the club doorway. There was no movement. I never thought she were dead at that time. I just thought she'd fainted or something. Police or ambulance men, I can't remember which, were just sort of all sort of crowding round. And you didn't know what had happened, and no one was telling you anything. Just saw, get back home, you know. I said, well, what's up? I was just told a terrible thing has happened, and I said, no, she's not dead. And they said, I'm afraid she is. Until I heard it myself, I just would not believe that anyone could have killed her. The police said from the start it was somebody local, and that it would be sorted by the weekend. They would have this person, no problem. In charge of the investigation was the man who'd led the hunt for Tracy Brown's attacker, Detective Superintendent Jim Hobson. Have you any idea as to motive? No, not at this stage. He hadn't been sexually assaulted, and uh, robbery doesn't seem to the, be the motive at this stage. Despite the police's confidence of an early arrest, the case remains unsolved after 20 years. And though no hammer was used in Debbie's murder, Hellowell insists there is evidence to link it to the Ripper. Sutcliffe didn't use the same type of methods to kill his victims, to assault his victims. He varied it. He varied the pattern. Sutcliffe admitted killing women in many different ways in order to fool the police. Some were killed with a hammer. Some were strangled. And others stabbed with knives or screwdrivers. I feel he may well have changed his pattern. He did in other murders. He may well have changed his pattern in this, but unless or until he confesses it, no one will know. As a lorry driver, Sutcliffe made frequent trips to an engineering plant called Kirkstall Forge, a hundred yards from Debbie's home. His work records reveal he was delivering to the forge on the very day Debbie was killed. No idea whatsoever that he delivered there at all, or that he had any connection with the uh, forge. 
Debbie got off the bus on her way home from work outside the Crystal Forge and he could have seen her and he could have followed her home from the forge and I can see the links they could possibly now have been him. A couple of days after Debbie's death, there was a prostitute killed in Bradford by the Yorkshire Ripper, Patricia Atkinson. And I, I just asked the police if the Yorkshire Ripper could be responsible for Debbie's murder because there was no motive. And they said it wasn't the red light area where he usually worked. There were no way that it could have been him. And I just had to accept what they said, but I've always had it back in my mind, the thought that it could have been him. Always. <laughs> By the summer of 1977, the police were still insisting that the Ripper only targeted prostitutes, though a growing number of his victims were not. Even when 16-year-old Jane MacDonald was murdered, they suggested he'd simply made a mistake. With newspapers mourning the Ripper's first innocent victim, George Oldfield was called in to lead the hunt. It looks very much to me as if he is selecting the women in the streets as his targets. I think it was a mistake that uh, he uh, attacked Jane MacDonald. Probably in her case, he mistook her for being a lady of the streets because she was out in that area at the time she was. There is a misconception that Sutcliffe attacked only prostitutes. Many, many of his victims were not. I do believe at the time that in his mind, he felt that he was uh, dealing and targeting prostitutes. In reality, he was not. Two years after Hallowell's work began, Sutcliffe was transferred to Broadmoor Hospital, diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. On the way down, I pull together all the papers. I decide which particular crimes I'm going to talk about get myself into what the time of year was, what it was like, things that would refresh Sutcliffe's memory. Also things that um, are key to me, things that have never been published, that only the police, the victims um, and the uh, criminal would know. As far as sitting facing someone who's committed these horrendous crimes and caused so much pain, sometimes you come out from those interviews and you just want fresh air. Sometimes you feel, I don't want to be here. I actually don't want to talk to this person. But you have to put your own personal feelings out of the way and, and do a job. Throughout 1978 and 79, the list of Ripper victims continued to grow. But some survived to describe their attacker, noting his black hair and beard. As the weeks and months went by, I'd see in the paper every so often, girl being attacked. Another few months go by, girl being attacked, killed, murdered. I saw this picture exactly the same description as what I'd given that the police were calling the Yorkshire Ripper. I thought, oh, that's a guy. It's obvious, the guy that attacked me. I went with my mother to keep the police station. I said, this is a guy that attacked me. I said, oh, I'll, I'll have me fun and games today, aren't we? I thought they're treating it as one big joke. If they'd have taken notice of it, 13 people and probably a few more would have been saved. But it was only following the murder of Joe Whittaker in 1979 that the police finally admitted that no woman was safe. The worrying thing now is that he's moved out of the red light areas where he's operated in the past, which makes it now that any woman is at risk. Then the police were sidetracked by a hoaxer. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. Good Lord. Police believed the tape was genuine and mounted a huge operation to find the man with the Geordie voice. 
little Georgia Field that came around and asked me to listen to the Geordie tape. But this guy didn't have a Geordie accent. It was a Yorkshire man. So it threw me off balance. I thought, you know, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. Do the police know whether they're coming or going? By now, Sutcliffe had been interviewed as a Ripper suspect nine times. But the police eliminated him from their inquiries because he didn't have a Geordie accent. Three months after the tape arrived, the quiet town of Ilkley was shocked by a vicious attack on a 21-year-old woman. In charge of the inquiry was Detective Superintendent John Stainthorpe, a veteran of two Ripper investigations. The young lady in question left her home in the centre of Ilkley and as she came into Springs Lane, she noticed a man. She just thought, he's waiting for someone and carried on towards a place of work. She continued to the railway footbridge. As she was near the far end of the footbridge, she heard footsteps behind her. She was attacked from behind by a man wielding a ballplane hammer. She was given a massive blow to the back of her head. And she's very lucky indeed to be alive today. The only reason she's alive today was the arrival of another person on the scene who had just alighted from a train and he disturbed the attacker. Had it not been for his arrival, he would have attacked her further with the hammer and left her a corpse. We had a, a very good eyewitness. The assailant had passed him directly under a lighted street lamp, so the witness had a very, very good look at him indeed. And he said he was a man in his 30s, in dark, crinkly hair, a swarthy complexion, a square face. He was clearly, in my view, another ripper attack, stalking a victim from behind, using a ballplane hammer. Certainly all my team, and I had about 60 officers there, I left them in, no doubt, and said, if we find this man, we find the ripper. But senior officers from the Ripper squad didn't think this was another Ripper attack, and uh, I was given the job of investigating it as a non-Ripper attempt murder. And I can well understand the reason for trying to implicate the public and saying this is unlikely to be a Ripper, because all it would have done would be to create more pressure, and we were a sinking ship, uh, believe you me. We were in uh, very deep trouble at that time. I don't think there was a reluctance to put attacks into the Ripper frame. You've got to remember that this had gone on over a number of years. There were a number of murders we didn't know which he had committed. Each case was looked at and the, the, the people in charge of the investigation at that time felt some were in, some were out. They made some mistakes both ways. Three years after his Ripper work began, Hellowell was promoted and left the West Yorkshire force. But such was his relationship with Sutcliffe that he decided to carry on his secret task. There were never periods during the whole investigation that I felt it was a waste of time. People might say, well, th this chap's gone away forever. He's never going to come out. Why? I think if, if, if it was your daughter, your sister, your mother, you would want to know why. You'd want to know who. You want that peace of mind. That's why we do it. This picture was done in a moment of utmost despair and anger shortly after I was attacked. This is how I felt inside, completely destroyed, mutilated. My jaw was wired up and I was suffering a great deal of pain and I thought I'd create this picture and send it to my attacker with the feeling that he would suffer as much as I had suffered. In October 1980, a young art student was savagely attacked the day before her 21st birthday. She'd spent the evening with friends in Headingley, the student area of Leeds, where the Ripper had struck just a month before. 
after leaving the pub. I headed through the university grounds. I thought, I'll take this shortcut. It'll get me to the bus stop quicker, and I'll be home safe. After going a few yards, I was aware that there was a figure watching me. I heard footsteps and someone came out from the right-hand side of the road and shouted, Oi, or hey, you. Hey, hey, do I know you? I'd never seen him before. He had a swarthy complexion and dark, dark hair. At the same time, Lorna Smith was returning home after meeting friends. As we turned towards the university, I was aware of a struggle. I do re distinctly remember seeing a man's arm raised. I don't know whether it was the right arm or the left arm, but I remember seeing a man's arm raised and I could hear shouts. As we got slightly closer, I remember seeing this man running off, and then we realised there was somebody lying in the gutter. And when I got even closer, I saw just how much blood was there. So much blood. It must have been a real shock to the people who came to my rescue. If they hadn't found me, I wouldn't be here now. I think he was ready for his final blow. My jaw was broken. I had a large dent in the top of my head. My skull was fractured. The doctor said these are similar wounds to some of the Ripper victims. Have you been in touch with the police? Have you told them? And I thought, I'll phone the police myself and relay what the doctors had said. They weren't very interested. As far as they were concerned, I'd just been beaten up. Detectives also took a statement from the eyewitness, Lorna Smith. What I do remember is the officer saying, if we decide to take this incident seriously, we may want to question you again. And that phrase, if we decide to take this seriously, just echoed in, I, I took my breath away. I, I just thought, what? What, do you have, what state do you have to be in for them to take it seriously? I, I found it just an extraordinary statement. Being a victim of such a vicious attack leaves you completely alone. You cannot explain the real despair that you feel. And I'm very fortunate in that I chose to manifest the anger through art. I was attacked outside a church. If it hadn't been for the people who intervened, I certainly wouldn't have been saved. This was an etching exploring the abandonment that I felt. The hand signifies the hand that could help me or the hand that attacks me. A rather harrowing picture of me naked and bleeding When no arrest was made, I felt confused and rather desperate. The police just dropped me. They just abandoned the whole incident. Sorry, we can't find anyone. Hard cheese. Again, Hellowell found many similarities with Ripper attacks. Well, the factors for me were firstly the location, uh, student territory, uh, close to a main road, late at night, single woman on her own. And she has got uh, medical evidence which shows that she received some severe bangs to the head. <coughs> I couldn't tell you what type of hammer was used, but they're certainly fractures of the skull. We actually have a relatively good eyewitness that describes the attacker having this swarthy complexion, which is very similar to Sutcliffe's. The timing of the attack is also significant. Sutcliffe's wife, Sonia, worked at this nursing home every Saturday night, 
giving him free reign to plan and execute his attacks. That's why all these acknowledged Ripper victims were also attacked on Saturday night. A month later, the Ripper returned to Headingley and another student, Jacqueline Hill, was murdered less than a mile from the attack on the art student. I remember a sort of cold recognition sweeping over me and I thought, oh my God, this has got to be the same attacker. It was a Saturday night, a woman, a student on her own. A hammer was used. I, I just felt that the two incidents were connected. Inside, I was screaming. Can't you see? Are you that stupid that you can't make a connection between what happened to me and what happened to her? That phrase kept coming back through my mind, if we decide to take this seriously. And I just remember thinking, well, if they had taken it seriously, would Jacqueline Hill have had to die? Again, the police were accused of incompetence. Within an hour of her murder, students found her blood-stained handbag, but the police treated it as an item of lost property. When they did search the area, they completely missed her body, and it lay undiscovered for several hours. I don't think they knew what they were doing. There was no direction, and it was complete and utter confusion. As Jacqueline Hill's family buried their daughter, the police were facing a barrage of criticism. But then, suddenly, the nightmare came to an end. Two patrol policemen arrested Sutcliffe in Sheffield, but only because his car had false number plates. In the car was prostitute Olivia Reavers, and when police discovered the ball-pane hammer he'd planned to use, he reluctantly began to confess. When photos of him appeared in newspapers, it set alarm bells ringing for many victims. I actually opened the newspaper and I saw this picture of him. I thought, oh my God, he is the guy that attacked me. I just remember thinking, thank God for that, he's out of the way. Yet the police never questioned Sutcliffe about Tracy Brown. The attacks on Gloria Wood and Debbie Schlesinger were never put to him, nor were the assaults in Ilkley or at Leeds University. They accepted his 20 confessions and rushed him to trial. The whole world was interested in this case. The pressure on us was such that we said, let's get to court and let's get him put behind bars. He admitted at that time 20 in all, and I think it was thought, that's enough. He's now got 20. We will move move forward. It's absolutely horrendous that the police were not asking Sutcliffe about his attack on me. Well, he was in this clear state of mind at the time to do that. They just wanted to get him through the system and locked up to satisfy the public's need to see a man jailed. Well, thanks a lot. Where does that leave everyone else? For the next ten years, Hellowell continued to visit Sutcliffe, urging him to confess to the unsolved crimes and to put the victims' minds at rest. Whether it's been worth the effort and time, I think other people will judge. But how much is a life worth investigating? I think Halliwell's got a very difficult task on his hand because it's so long ago. And as hours and days and weeks and months and years pass, it's going to be harder and harder for him to get any sense out of Sutcliffe. But in 1992, after 10 years of Hellowell's perseverance, a letter from Sutcliffe finally broke the deadlock. He asked me to go and see him. It would be to my advantage, I think. That was how he put it. When I arrived, he admitted to attempted murders that were very high on my list of probables. And he related all those years on detailed circumstances of those attempted murders that only the criminal would know. He first confessed to an unpublicized attack on a student in the grounds of this Leeds College in 1979. Then he admitted attacking Tracy Brown. 
He remembered that he actually put her over a fence. That hadn't been disclosed. We hadn't uh, made that public at all. So only he would know that. He also recalled, because he actually raised it with his mother-in-law, uh, that the photo fit that uh, Tracy did of her attacker was exactly like him. And he said to his mother-in-law, look, this could be me, and they had a bit of a joke about it. Despite Sutcliffe's confessions, the Director of Public Prosecutions ruled it was not in the public interest to take him back to court. Although I didn't know who it was for all these years, there was that element of doubt because it took so long for him to confess to it. It was like sealing it, really, you know, just closing the lid on it, really. That uh, it's just it was something which I knew all along. Earlier this year, Tracy finally met the man who secured the confessions, 17 years after the attack. Why do you think it took so long? All sorts of reasons. Sometimes people want to put things behind them, feeling that, well, I've told everybody everything, I've gone through this, why should I tell any more? How has he come across as a person? Did he come across as being a cold-calculated murder that he is? Or is there a, a glimmer of a human person inside that, inside that, ex that, that exterior? He's um, quiet, polite. Sometimes people imagine people who do horrific things as being... Um, sort of creatures that are unrecognisable from human beings. Mm. They're not. The photo fit picture which I made, mm. which was um, very, very much like mm. him, mm. why was that ignored for so long? I don't think it was. We clearly knew the type of person that we were looking for, but we needed to link in, in so many other ways. And, of course, I think we were sidetracked with the uh, ripper tapes, as, as they became called. I just thought that I just didn't take it very seriously at all. Mm. And because of this, um, a lot of people could have been saved today. What has been achieved is a very painstaking investigation into outstanding murders and attempted murders. Two victims can now be reassured that the person who committed that crime is behind bars and is not going to come out again. But then to continue with the others, because I believe that, that there are others, and I have this feeling that, that he will one day uh, tell me the truth about all of them. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has... The church is a blessing to me. I get reassurance and comfort. I would like Peter Sutcliffe, if it was him who attacked me, to admit to it. I don't hate him. I've forgiven him. It's been very hard to do. I've got my family back and I'm grateful for every day because I've lived to see my grandchildren growing up when I might have died. I just want to get on with living, put it behind me, draw a line under it and start again. If it was proven that it was Sutcliffe who had murdered my sister, it would give you peace of mind to know that someone is paying for what they've done. At least you can put a face to the person who's killed her. It'll never bring her back, but nobody has the right to go around killing people and not pay the price. I need to know who did this to me. It's a bit like people who have lost their loved ones but never see the body. You need something very concrete to step away from. If Peter Sutcliffe confessed to trying to kill me, I would say, well, I knew that. It might give me a sense of relief. I would hope there'd be some relief somewhere before I die. On the other hand, Sutcliffe might take the secret to his grave. And then I have to live out the rest of my life, never knowing. And that's a painful thought. <laughs>